Okay, this book, is, this is a book review of Tripping Over the Truth. Here's the book, Tripping Over the Truth by Travis Christofferson. It's a good book. I actually think, you know, I've read a whole bunch of books about cancer. I think this is one of the best ones. He does a very good job of explaining the reasons to support the um, met metabolic theory of cancer. And I think that's a really important thing. The most important thing you can understand starting out about cancer is the metabolic theory of cancer makes a lot of sense and it's supported by tons of data. I personally agree with him. I think the somatic mutation theory is bogus and that's relevant because the somatic muta mutation theory is the one that is recommended by most textbooks and by most old-fashioned conventional thinkers on cancer but I think it leads you nowhere uh, versus once you understand the metabolic theory of cancer, it gives you all kinds of ideas what you can do to help yourself. And I think it's scientifically correct based on everything I've read. Um, so, oh, first of all, what this slide about is here is I had previously talked about how when you have platelet activation from psychological stress or for other reasons, the platelets can coat cancer cells or on their outer surface, these little tiny purple circles are the platelets and they're interacting with the outer surface of these cells, these cancer cells. And the point being is when the immune system comes by to check for cancer cells, the platelets coating the outer surface of the cell will interact with the immune system cell and they will hide the cancer cells, so to speak. So here's the WBC, white blood cell, saying, what's going on here? And the platelet cells, oh, it's okay, he's with us and they're hiding the cancer cells. So the immune system says, okay, move along, move along. And the point being is uh, the platelets are messing things up. And that's one of the problems why stress is bad for cancer, caffeine bad for cancer, sleep deprivation, all that stuff. Okay, now I'm gonna show you what I think is one of the coolest, best slides of this whole talk and one of the best things you could ever know about cancer. Why does it happen? And you know, the old mutation theory, I think it's so bogus, it's ridiculous. And what I mean by that is pretty much almost all cancer cells have this particular change in their DNA transcription. So a new protein is being made called hexokinase 2, hexokinase 2, and that's opposed to hexokinase 1. So hexo means 6, kinase means to add a phosphate. And what basically happens is imagine you're a regular cell, a regular human cell, and you're making your energy from oxygen, oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. You can make tons of ATP. You can make like 36 ATPs from that per glucose. Versus with anaerobic glycolysis, you only make two. So what happens is when there's hypoxia, lack of oxygen going to the cell, it's as if the main electrical generator, uh, electric supply is shut down. So the mitochondria says an, sends an emergency message to the, the nucleus. Hey, I cannot produce energy here. You're going to have to switch on the backup generators, which means run more glycolysis. And so that tells the nucleus, make more of the enzymes for the glycolytic pathway. In particular, switch over to making HK2. So instead of hexokinase 1 is normal glycolysis, HK2 is unique in that it binds to the mitochondria. And not only binds to the mitochondria, right here's our HK2, it also binds to VDEC which is a voltage dependent anion channel. And more importantly, that stabilizes the mitochondrial memory because a lot of cells, when they're hypoxic, they say, oh, uh-oh, can't make energy, time to die. Well, let's recycle ourselves and save these molecules for the rest of the body rather than uh, undergo necrosis. Necrosis means a sudden death of a cell that's unprogrammed, whereby its plasma membrane lyses and its inner contents are spilled um, out into the extra extracellular matrix and that leads to a big inflammatory reaction and those chemicals are lost they're destroyed so it's better for the human body as a multicellular organism to recycle its cells when they die gradually from partial hypoxia um, rather than sudden massive hypoxia like with a big stroke with a big clot embolus blocking an artery causing complete loss of oxygen versus partial loss of oxygen okay so what I'm basically saying here this is a crucial point you're not seeing some individual mutation. That's all bogus. What you're seeing is the cell is making a, a decision to switch from aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism. And in so doing, it amplifies the production of a whole bunch of enzymes that go with anaerobic metabolism. So it's not a single thing. It's a big transformation of the cell. All right, and the cell says, previously I was part of a multicellular organ system, part of a kidney, a lung, a liver, um, but now I'm on my own. 
I don't got enough oxygen to do all the stuff they need a liver cell to do, you know, to detox things, to manage blood glucose, to make bile. Screw it. You guys are on your own. Goodbye. I am just going to multiply as much as I can anaerobically, and then I'm going to move out of here, find a new apartment somewhere else. And in so doing, it's as if the cell made a conscious decision to transform itself into functioning like an anaerobic bacteria. And this is the key thing that's present in virtually all cancer cells. Hexokinase 2. And, and, you, and, you, and a cancer cell will suck up 100 times as much glucose as a regular cell. And then also it will attach to VDAC to stabilize the mitochondrial membrane. This is essential thing to understand. This comes from this paper, by the way, emerging glycolysis targeting by this guy down here, uh, Dr. Shen. So anyways, this is, this is big stuff in cancer. Getting this is big stuff and hardly anyone knows this. That's why I'm showing it to you and putting it right at the beginning of the talk that this is it. Hexokinase 2 is the mutation. It is the big one. It is the most important one. It is the big thing that happens in cancer. Okay. Now, getting back to the Warburg effect means hypoxia inducing a cell to transform itself into becoming cancer. We talked about how a lot of things contribute to hypoxia. Regular old blood flow, red blood cells here traveling through a capillary. The spindle-shaped cells are the uh, endothelial cells. This is the capillary basement membrane and normally they can pass oxygen through it quite easily going to let's say a neuron here or some other cell in the body versus with chronic diabetes, chronic hypertension, the capillary basement membrane becomes thick and when the capillary basement membrane is thick I got less blue circles going up to the cell, the tissue, because less oxygen can get through it. So this is a contributor to oxygen deficiency in the tissue and other things that will contribute to this high fat diet less oxygen gets delivered to the tissue sodium phasal constricts narrows the artery less oxygen gets to the tissues all these things cause hypoxia hypoxia can lead a cell to transform itself into functioning like an anaerobic bacteria and that is called the Warburg effect or actually I think I wanted to show you this other cell this is just something I've shown you before that uh, red blood cell is about 7 microns in diameter. Capillary is about 5 microns in diameter, so it has to deform to get through there. When you eat a high-fat diet, you get Rouleau formation, especially from the LDL cholesterol. You get a generalized blood sludge effect from the other lipids as well. But this causes RBCs to stick together, so it's harder for them to get through the capillary. Blood pressure has to go up, and you get this whole cascade of negative events when you eat high-fat um, food. Uh, this was a study done in the past by Peter Kuo. He's a cardiologist in uh, Pennsylvania. And he found that if you fed patients a high-fat meal, typically this would be like with saturated fat, the lipids start being significantly elevated about three hours, peak at about five hours, not significantly down until at least seven hours. And right at this time, he did it with a whole bunch of patients with known cardiac angina, meaning coronary artery narrowing that was symptomatic. And right at peak lipemia, they checked their blood lipids every 30 minutes. That's when they would get their chest pain. So it correlated perfectly. Um, so that's my point. You're inducing hypoxia in your heart, getting chest pain. You're inducing hypoxia everywhere else in the body. Transient hypoxia, the body can handle it relatively well, but chronic, recurrent, persistent, prolonged hypoxia, the body does not handle that well. Um, and Warburg only had to do it for a couple of hours. I don't know the exact number of hours, but it was less than a day of, of uh, ongoing hypoxia to cause um, transformation of cells into cancer. And also, this is with uh, sat fat, you know, saturated fat, like animal food fat. But if you used uh, omega-6 cooking oil, it was worse. Uh, Quo's lab and um, Ray Rosenman and Meyer, Meyer Friedman, they got prolonged duration of uh, blood sludge and uh, relative hypoxia from omega-6 cooking oils. Okay, here's a nice uh, new slide showing. Here's a normal cell, here's a cancer cell. A normal cell takes its glucose, converts it into pyruvate through glycolysis, runs it through the mitochondrial Krebs cycle, and then electron transport oxphos makes tons of ATP. You know, like we're saying, anywhere from 30 to 38 ATP per glucose. The reason it's a little variable how much ATP you get is sometimes some of that energy is used for other things, for generating heat, for uh, pumping um, other molecules across the mitochondrial membrane. All right, well, anyways, then you produce a little bit of protein, a little bit of nucleic acids, a little bit of carbohydrate and lipids. All right, now here's a cancer cell. First of all, glucose is in giant big letters because they use up to like 100 times as much glucose as a regular cell. Then it goes to pyruvate. And then the pyruvate 
is metabolized anaerobically. It gets converted into lactate. Lactate lets it regenerate NAD so you can keep running glycolysis. The lactic acid is pumped out into the extracellular matrix and that acidifies the space around the cancer cell. And that also impairs immune function cells around it and it gives it a competitive advantage over the cells adjacent to it. So the cancer cell is controlling its, its outer milieu, the tumor milieu, extracellular environment to its own advantage, of course. And it has to make tons of protein because it has to replicate itself. It has to double everything it has. The human genome has 3.3 billion, that's B as in billion, base pairs. And it has to be a copy on each side of those base pairs. So you're talking about you got to make 6.6 billion nucleic acids. That's a ton of nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are made out of sugar uh, running through the pentose uh, phosphate shunt pathway. And they're also made out of amino acids to construct the nucleotide bases. You need a source of nitrogen. So the point is they have to be a synthetic machine uh, to crank out. That's the rate limiting step in cell replication is, is, is making a copy of all the, the DNA, okay? And so, and some of the RNA stuff. So it takes time and it takes tons of substrate. The other thing that contributes a lot to making these uh, building blocks for macromolecule synthesis is glutamine. Glutamine is the most common amino acid. And that's one of the reasons why I know T. Colin Campbell says as long as you lower animal protein, you're good to go. But it seems wise to me you might want to lower your overall protein a little bit. Okay, And that comes out of the data, James Mitchell, PhD research and whatnot. And it just seems right to me. Am I 100% sure of that? No, I'm not. But that seems a little wise to me. Because glutamine is a major source for these macromolecules. Um, and in rodents, uh, protein restrictions, there's reasons to think that it might be beneficial. Okay. Um, this paper was the landscape of cancer genes and mutational processes in breast cancer. Oh, this is just one part of the data from the Genome Atlas Project. So those are like the DNA base pairs, TGCA, the Genome, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project. And it showed, they were expecting it would show all these characteristic mutations for each type of cancer, and they could specifically use those mutations to target the protein made by that gene and treat that individual cancer, but it was bogus. It didn't work, okay? The Genome Atlas Project showed a bewildering array of um, a large variety of random mutations, okay? And the reason is the cancer happens first due to injury to the mitochondria, most commonly from hypoxia, also due to some carcinogens or mutagens that injure the mitochondria. And once the mitochondria is injured, you don't have enough energy to man maintain all your DNA enzyme repair systems, and you start getting more mutations. So that's why you will have a lot of mutations in a cancer, but you will not, it's not the, for, it's not the beginning part of it. And that's why there's not a characteristic pattern. They couldn't find any significant characteristic patterns in the Genome Atlas product. It was a big shock to the people who would sort of been trained only in the genetic theory, the somatic mutation theory. And so this was actually a big deal in the history of cancer research. And I think this guy, Travis Christofferson, he did an excellent job of describing that. Uh, tripping on the truth, Travis Christofferson. He's got videos online if you want to watch his videos. He's good. I mean, I like him. He's a smart guy and he's good with his basic biochemistry. But the spot where he screws up is he's sort of friends, with, I think, with uh, Thomas Seyfried. And Thomas Seyfried and him, they're both smart guys, and they've both done something really good for cancer patients by developing understanding of the metabolic theory of cancer. However, I think they're both screwing up in that they promote the ketogenic diet. And, like, why? how could somebody prevent promote something as stupid as a ketogenic diet? And in my opinion, the reason they do that is because... They're narrow. You're going to see most doctors, most PhDs, in my experience, they're really knowledgeable about their own tight, specific field. But it's very few that have read extensively outside their narrow field. So they might know a tremendous amount about their one particular area, but be absolute moronic idiots about nutrition, about other aspects of cancer and biochemistry, for example. And that's what I think is happening here. Because, you know... T. Colin Campbell, the number one thing that causes cancer is eating meat. And so here's these guys saying, eat meat for cancer? That's entirely stupid. I think that guy T. Colin Campbell is brilliant. On the subject of animal protein, he's the best in the world, all right? Um, so anyways, so that's the, the Genome Atlas product. You need to know that because people are going to tell you, you're going to open up a book and it'll say, cancer is a genetic disease. BS. It's a metabolic disease. That's an important point. It's a metabolic disease, not a genetic disease. And there's tons of data to support that statement. And if you don't get that, you'll have a hard time getting anything else. So you need to understand that. Read about it on your own. You'll, you'll see. Read the genetic theory. Go online. Watch the videos of Thomas Seyfried and of um, 
Travis Christofferson here, and then start reading more about it. Read about Farberg. It'll it'll become pretty obvious. It'll make sense. Okay, so this is some work from Thomas Seifried. So here's Seifried. This is his book, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease, from 2012. And here's this beautiful study that he is explaining. So here's a normal cell. It divides, and here's the daughter cells. And the circle thing here is the nucleus. The little round things that look like a peanut, those are mitochondria. And then the fluid around the mitochondria, that's the cytoplasm. Okay, so if you have a cancer cell, it divides, it makes two more cancer cells. But what they did was very clever. They did what are called cell transfer experiments. So what they did here is they took the nucleus and they took the nucleus of a cancer cell and they put it into a normal cell and they wanted to see what happens. That cell divides, no cancer. Okay, that's an important point. Whatever was causing cancer, it's not in the nucleus, it's not in the DNA, therefore it is not caused by a mutation. Whereas when they took the cytoplasm of the cancer cell, meaning the fluid in here, uh, as well as the mitochondria, and they transplanted that, a normal nucleus into that, they got cancer in virtually almost every single cell. So the point was the controlling substance that was causing the cancer was whatever was in the cytoplasm and the mitochondria, and it's the mitochondrial failure. All right, The cell can't make energy. It's either going to die, going into apoptosis, or it's going to transform itself into becoming like an anaerobic bacteria. So this is of tremendous importance. This is supporting data for the metabolic theory of cancer, which is the only theory that makes sense, okay? And you ask yourself, well, why do I think this is such a big deal? Because if I had known this, you know, 25 years ago, I might have been able to save my mother's life. 30 years ago, I wish I had known this. Uh, but I didn't. Um, and, you know, this was being worked on in the 1970s. Varberg did his work. He won the Nobel Prize in 1931. It pisses me off that nobody told me this. And I know why nobody told me this, because no one knew it. Um, and I, I, like I said, I knew the oncologists who took care of my mom. They, the, they loved her. They were friends with my mom. They did the best they could. And, I, and, I, and she, lived, she lived 11 years instead of only living two or three, which was the initial you know, prediction prognosis. So anyways, just once again, here is the money. Hexokinase 2 is upregulated, meaning tons more of it is made so the cancer cell, like a vacuum, can suck in more glucose from the blood. And it's in the perfect location. There's still a little bit of ATP being made by the mitochondria, so not all the mitochondria in the cell are destroyed. A typical cell will have, you know, let's say hundreds, even thousands of mitochondria. And some of them still work at least a little bit. They are abnormal. If you look at the mitochondria in these cells with an electron microscope, they'll be much fewer in number, let's say half as many as usual. They'll be abnormal, it's abnormally small, abnormally deformed in shape, having like these big empty spaces inside of them rather than the typical Christe um, convoluted membrane and whatnot. But this is the money thing. Um, this is the most important thing you can get from this talk is cancer is a metabolic disease and the essential uh, change in gene transcription is hexokinase 2 being upregulated, binding to the mitochondria to prevent apoptosis. Because the mitochondria splits open, releases cytochrome C, and that activates a whole pathway of apoptosis, programmed cell death. This does not let that happen. It blocks Bax. Bax is this protein that's part of the cascade of events in um, mitochondrial directed apoptosis, programmed cell death of a cell. Okay, so here's the book again, Tripping Over the Truth by Travis Christofferson, copyright 2017, and it's a good book. He explains things clear. He's nice. I like him. His talks are good. I like the guy, but I think he doesn't know enough about nutrition. That's why he recommends keto diet, which I think is ignorant. Okay, the Genome Atlas Project, we talked about the mutation pattern was chaotic and random. Nothing could be derived from it, intelligent or meaningful. Uh, Peter Peterson is this brilliant American scientist who figured out that hexokinase 2 upregulation was the key change in gene transcription characteristic of essentially all cancers. You know, maybe there's an exception to that. I'm not sure. I'm not aware of it, but there might be. But as far as I know, that's in all of them. And what does that mean? Well, if all of them have a metabolic cause, maybe all of them benefit from a metabolic treatment. You see how fantastically useful that is? Trust me, that's big news. Okay, that's an AO, academic orgasm, all right? Um, let's see, hypoxia causes a power failure in the mitochondria, and then uh, as Travis Christofferson says, it's like turning on the backup generators or we're gonna die, that the cell then runs on anaerobic glycolysis. 
Um, it also starts sucking up glutamine as well as uh, sucking up glucose. Um, and so the whole point is the DNA mutations are a sequela of cell transformation. And they are not the cause of it. And virtually every cancer cell had HK2, hexokinase 2 attached to the mitochondrial membrane and VDAC to prevent apoptosis. And again, this implies that almost all cancers are likely to benefit from metabolic treatments. That is so important, it is not even funny. That is like a life-changing thing. This could be the difference between dead in six months and alive 30 years later. Implies that almost all cancers are likely to benefit from metabolic treatments. I'll say that one more time. Cancer, according to all this research, appears to be a metabolic disease, and this implies that almost all cancers are likely to benefit from metabolic treatments. That is an incredibly useful thing. If that's all you learn in the next six months, you'll have learned a lot. That is such a big thing. I could have saved my mother's life if I had known that. Okay, Otto Warburg, you know, he was the great biochemist from Germany, won the Nobel Prize in 1931. People think he was the greatest biochemist of the entire 1900s, according to some. And he's the one who figured out in tissue culture um, a couple hours of deprivation of oxygen and he could transform cells into cancer. And that that was, in his opinion, he's, and we think he's right, the primary cause of cancer. And everything else indirectly somehow channeled into causing mitochondrial injury, or most commonly hypoxia. Um, and he, you know, according to the thing, different things I've read, some say the cancerous um, mitochondria are only making a residual of about 5% of the energy production. They're running Krebs cycle. Usually a lot of times Krebs cycle is running backwards. But okay, uh, and Warburg, he understood this. He said, hey, if you want to keep the cell healthy, you need to keep up the speed of the blood. Yeah, you don't want this blood sludge, slow blood flow. Um, uh, cancer cells also shed a lot of uh when they get to be a centimeter in size or bigger, they'll shed a lot of cancer cells into the blood. So you need a good functioning immune system to remove those. That's why you want to do a lot of things um, that'll optimize your immune system function. Fruits are very low in methionine. We talked about methionine restriction in a previous lecture. It's a useful topic as well. Okay, we're finishing up here. This is the last slide. Oh, actually, I think I got one more slide after this. I'm not sure, but I think I'm just about done. Anyways, uh, what about cancer milieu? Yeah, there's a cancer milieu. I'll talk about this in some other talk, but as Travis Christopherson describes it in his Tripping Over the Truth book, hexokinase 2 is the major transformative change, upregulation of that enzyme that enables cancer cells to suck more glucose into the cell, and that's how they get their energy from. Um, let's see. Oh, another thing that happens, because the cell is running on anaerobic metabolism, it's not running Krebs cycle in a forward direction, it's not popping out all that CO2. Because remember, in Krebs cycle, you pop out a lot of CO2 as you decarboxylate those intermediates. Well, guess what? That CO2 causes vasodilatation. So that lack of generating CO2s leads to a lack of dilating the arteries, leads to a lack of oxygen. And you get a prolonged, increased, hypoxic, oxygen-depleted tumor milieu and that favors the cancer over the surrounding cells. So the surrounding cells are screwed. The cancer is sucking up all the iron, so they're iron depleted. They can't function well. It's sucking up all the glucose, so they don't get enough glucose energy. And it's pumping out lactic acid on top of them, which also impairs their function and impairs immune system function. So this cancer cell is not one little change. It's a giant, massive series of steps to allow itself to function like an anaerobic bacteria, to grow in location, and then to spread outward. Okay. Okay, now this is definitely the last cell. Some theories of cancer. So we talked about the somatic mutation theory, which I think is totally overrated, and I think it's essentially been refuted, especially by the Genome Atlas Project and also by those uh, cell transfer experiments where they move the mitochondria versus moving the cell nucleus, etc., and the random pattern of mutations, etc. So Tripping Over the Truth has a lot of discussion of it and very good. And that's also why I think there have been some initial improvements, you know, in cancer treatment with the surgeries and with the chemotherapy, but nowhere near as much as has been hoped. And I think it's because they'll need to start working with the metabolic theory. And there's a lot of things that they can do. Um, and like repurposed drugs, I think that's been underutilized. A combination of uh, whatever other treatment is done with optimal nutrition and all these other things we've talked about. The trophoblast theory of cancer was popularized by Nicholas Gonzalez. 
And he is a bright guy, and he did have some clever things to say when he writes, but he also said some stuff that I thought was BS. He sort of went down this path of recommending a meat diet for some patients, not for other patients. You know, this whole diet type based on your personality, I thought that was all BS. So I kind of lost a little bit of respect for his uh, ideas when he started going on that path. But, you know, I'll, I'll read a whole bunch of authors, even if I totally disagree with them. If they seem intelligent and they have a few good things to say, I'll read their book. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to buy into a lot of other things he says. Um, infection, inflammation, theory of cancer, we talked about that, how that ends up being, yes, there can be some genetic things happening with the virus, but it also ends up going down the path of inflammation, ischemia, hypoxia. Metabolic theory of cancer by Weyerberg, that's the best. That opens up everything in cancer uh, thought and study. And this Peter Peterson guy, he's an American scientist, Danish Roots, he was a, a student of Albert Leninger. And that's where you see great scientists coming out in this, ver you know, the whole Varberg school leading to, you know, uh, Krebs, Ebden Meyerhoff and whatnot, and then the whole school of uh, Leninger. I like Leninger. Of all the biochemistry books, it to me seems the, the one that has the best attitude. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of good pictures in the other ones, but I like Leninger's attitude. <laughs> he has respect for the history and stuff more than the other ones do. That's good. Okay, uh, we talked about HKA2, hexokinase 2. Sorry about the dog. Um, let's see. Uh, typically, the, uh, the other cells, the cancer cells, are only 50% as many mitochondria, and they're all abnormal in shape. Okay, um, so the teaching point is everybody's got some cells that have been initiated, the first step of cancer, in their body. And the immune system hopefully has removed them. Perhaps not. Perhaps they're sitting around dormant. So just... Keep your cells well oxygenated. You'll probably never progress to a clinically symptomatic cancer. And we've already been through this plenty of times. Low fat, low sodium, whole food, vegan diet, no meat, no sweet, no oil, no caffeine. And have a strong immune system. Get your exercise. Get that uh, uh, lymphatic flow going. Try to have positive social relationships. Um, have a strong purpose in life. You know, let's say to help your kid, to help some good cause, to help other people, whatever it might be. Uh, help others. Um, and so I uh, hope that helps.